These notes are going to be our introduction to areas and distances. So first we talk about what's referred to as the area problem. And area is something we're very familiar with. I mean, we know how to find the area of familiar shapes. So things like rectangles, that would be length times width, triangles, we've got one half base times height, circles, we've got pi r squared. But what happens when we're trying to find area and our shape isn't a familiar figure? How would we find the area contained, let's say, within something that looked like this? So we posed a slightly easier problem, believe it or not. Um, essentially, we've boiled down the area problem to this. Find the area of a region that lies under a curve y equals f of x from x equals a to x equals b. And here's how this kind of works out. Eventually, we're just going to talk about, let's say, part of this. We can worry about the other part. And let's say we were to put an axis, one of the axes here, and the other axis here. So we've got x and y. If I was just looking for, let's say, this to start, we'll, we'll deal with the whole thing eventually, but right now let's just talk about this part. If I can figure out a function, then what I've got is I just need to find the area under the curve from a certain starting point, call that A, to a certain ending point, call that B. So this is the general idea of the area problem. Let's make this a little more specific by looking at a specific function. Uh, let's estimate the area under the curve f of x equals x squared from x equals 0 to x equals 1. So we know what the graph of f of x equals x squared looks like. I mean, that's our basic shape parabola. It's got a vertex at the origin. And of course, it's a much bigger graph than this. But I really want to just focus on it from an x value of 0, which is here at 0, 0, to an x value of 1, which makes this point right here, the ordered pair, 1, 1. And I want to try and estimate the area under the curve. Now, you got to be a little careful. When we say under the curve. It's a little bit misleading. What we actually mean by that is the area between the curve and the x-axis. Because if you're looking at y equals x squared or f of x equals x squared, if you were to look for area under it, it and went below the x-axis, it would just continue on infinitely long. So what we're actually referring to here is the area between f of x equals x squared and the x-axis. So this region right here. So we start off by doing what all good mathematicians do. If you don't know how to approach a problem, try to turn it into something that you do know how to work with. And as I just mentioned, if we could turn this, this somehow into a familiar shape, we'd be able to use a formula to estimate the area under this curve. So let's start off by taking a look at, what, at a rectangle. Okay, so here's one rectangle. And if I instead just found the area of this rectangle, now this is what is referred to as a right endpoint rectangle. And it's called a right endpoint rectangle because notice the right side of this rectangle is sitting on the function. There are other types of rectangles that we'll take a look at in just a little bit. So if we take a look at this one right endpoint rectangle, that's what we refer to as R sub 1, right endpoint rectangles, and only one of them. But before we actually work on the area, I want to clear up some vocabulary that we're going to use. Because the drawback to the formula for the area of a rectangle is when you refer to lengths and widths of rectangles, they're kind of interchangeable. I mean, you and I can look at the same rectangle and say, oh, well, I think this is the width and this is the length, and, you know, I switch it compared to you. And we want to be very clear about what we're referring to. So when we talk about these rectangles, instead of referring to width and length, we're going to refer to width and height. It makes it a little bit clearer as to which is which. This is the width of a rectangle. This is the height of a rectangle. So when we do that, the formula becomes the area will be equal to the width times the height. So the width of this is going to be 1. The height of this is also 1. And that's because it sits on this particular function. If this were a different function, we'd get a different height. But its height is also 1. So the area of this rectangle is 1. So if we say that the area under the curve is about the same as the area contained within the rectangle, we're not technically wrong, but that's a pretty bad estimate. I mean, even if I halved this thing, if I cut this rectangle in half, 
even that would be a better estimate than dealing with the entire rectangle. So it is an estimate, it's just not a particularly good one. All right, well, let's see if we can improve on that then. Instead of using one rectangle to try and estimate the area under the curve, what if we used two instead? And to save you from my rather poor drawings, let's see if I can help us out. Here is a picture of f of x equals x squared. That's the black line. That's our function. It does go from 0, 0 to 1, 1, which is up here. And this is what we refer to as two right endpoint rectangles. Notice each individual rectangle, the right side is sitting on the function. The height of the rectangle is on the function on the right hand side. If we instead use these to estimate the area under the curve, we'd go about it basically the same way. We need to take the width times the height of each rectangle and add the two together. So this is what we refer to as r sub 2, because we're using two right endpoint rectangles. So for the first one, these widths should be the same. We're going to make sure that we divide this interval, starting at 0 and ending at 1, into two equal widths. So each one of those, then, will be 1 half long. So for the first rectangle, its width is 1 half. Its height, take a look at this point right here. The height of this rectangle is a y value. The question is, how do I know what the y value is? Well, it depends on the x value. The x value is 1 half, and we plug that into this particular function. Now, this function is y equals x squared. So when we plug 1 half into the function, it becomes 1 half squared. And yes, that's 1 fourth, but that's how we're going to figure out that this is the ordered pair, 1 half, 1 fourth or 1 half squared. Again, if this were a different function, I'd get a different y value. That's our first rectangle. Our second rectangle, its width is also 1 half, and its height is going to be its x value plugged into the function as well. So again, this is 1, and yes, that's 1, 1, just like we described in the last example when we were only using one rectangle, but the reason it's 1, 1 is because it's 1, 1 squared. So when we add those together, we get 1 eighth plus 1 half, also known as 5 eighths. So if we were to use two right endpoint rectangles to estimate the area under the curve, we'd say that this area should be approximately equal to 5 eighths. And again, it's still not a great estimate, but you know what? It's better than when we only used one rectangle. So if it was better when we used two rectangles instead of one, maybe it would be even better if we used three rectangles instead. So we're going to do the same idea. We're going to talk about r sub 3. These are all right endpoint rectangles. The height is determined by the right side of the rectangle sitting on the function. What would the width be of each one of these rectangles? Well, the length of the entire interval is 1, and we're going to divide it into three equal pieces. So each width is going to be 1 third. So for the first rectangle, its area is its width, 1 third, times its height. Well, again, its height is determined by the y value on this point right here. Well, how do you know what the y value is? you plug the x value into the function. The x value is 1 third, and the function is x squared, so we're going to square the x value. That will give me the area of the first rectangle. The second rectangle, its width is also 1 third, so then we need its height, which is given by the y value at this point. We'll notice the x value at this point we went one-third over for the first x value. We need to go another one-third over, so it's one-third plus another one-third for two-thirds. So the y value at this point is two-thirds squared. Two-thirds is the x value, squaring it because that's our function. For the last one, this point here, 
the last rectangle, its width is one third, and its y value is given by plugging its x value into the function. And yes, that is going to be one squared again, but we're going to try to establish a little bit of a pattern here. So it helps to think of that, instead of thinking of that as one squared, which it is, sometimes it's helpful to think of that as three thirds squared. Three thirds because you went over one third for the first rectangle, another one third for a total of two thirds for the second rectangle, and three thirds for the third rectangle. So that's the x value of three thirds plugged into the function, and that's why it's squared. And when we do the calculations on that, notice, by the way, each one of these has a one-third in common. I'm going to go ahead and factor that out. It'll make my calculations a little bit easier to work with. And then that will be a one-ninth plus a four-ninths plus a nine-ninths. And yes, of course, that's one. But again, I'm just trying to establish a pattern here. And when you put all that together, we're going to get 14 twenty-sevenths. So we are approximating the area to be about 14 over 27. Now, this is a good time to mention, if you notice in the pictures that I've picked up, they're using decimals along the axes. Whenever possible, we're going to use actual fractions instead. And this is an excellent illustration of why. Notice my width was one third. They've got it sitting here at point, here's my point three. This is like point three three repeating but it's difficult to use a repeating def decimal in calculations. So generally we want to try and stick to these as being fractions as much as humanly possible. So I think we're starting to get the idea that the more rectangles we use, probably the better estimate we're going to get. So we can use four rectangles to do this. We can do five rectangles to do this, for example. Here's what five rectangles looks like. Notice the width of each one of these. What would it be? Again, ignore those decimals. We don't really want to use decimals unless we absolutely have to. The total length of your interval is 1, and you're dividing it up into 5 equal pieces. So the width of each one of these is going to be 1 -fifth. If we want to talk about the heights of each rectangle, let's say this one, for example, the ordered pair right here is going to be 1 -fifth, and then the 1 -fifth plugged into the function, which again, we're still dealing with y equals x squared. So it's going to be 1 fifth, 1 fifth squared. In other words, it's 1 fifth, 1 25th. For the next height, we need to know the x value. Well, if the first x value is 1 fifth over, the net one following is going to be 2 fifths. So the x value is 2 fifths. The y value will be 2 fifths squared. This ordered pair will be 3 fifths. 3 fifths plugged into the function, 3 fifths squared. What will this one be? It'll be 4 fifths, 4 fifths squared. And of course the last one will be 5 fifths, also known as 1, and then 5 fifths squared, also known as 1. So we're going to take a look at those calculations, but before we do, Let's ask a question. When we get an estimation of the area under y equals x squared from 0 to 1 by using five right endpoint rectangles, that's what we're doing in this particular picture, are we going to be too high or are we going to be too low? And if you look at the picture, it's pretty clear at the moment that that's going to give us a number that's way too high. Okay? This is what we refer to as an overestimate. Now, using right endpoint rectangles does not always give you an overestimate. We'll be able to see some examples where that's not necessarily true. But let's take a look at the calculations first. So here's r sub 5. There's 1 fifth times 1 fifth squared. That's the width times the height of the first rectangle. Plus 1 fifth times 2 fifths squared. There's my second rectangle. Third, fourth, and fifth. There are the areas of each of my five rectangles being added together. So I just need to do the calculations. So notice again, each one of those has a, a one-fifth in common. I factored it out. And then bear with me. I'm going to do the arithmetic probably just a little bit differently than you would, but I have good reason for doing it the way I do um, based on where we're heading in the next couple of concepts. 
Um, so what I did is I squared the numerators and the denominators of each fraction. So 1 fifth squared became 1 squared over 5 squared, for example. 2 fifths squared became 2 squared over 5 squared. Now the reason I did that is now notice what each one of those fractions has in common in its denominator. They all have a 5 squared. So just like I factored out a 1 over 5, I can now also factor out a 1 over 5 squared from each one of those. So what I'll get is 1 over 5 cubed, and inside my parentheses, I will just have 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, etc. That's actually going to make my calculation a lot easier to do, and it's going to help me work with these calculations a little bit down the road. So now rather than dealing with all the different fractions, I can just take 1 over 125 times 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16 plus 25. And what I get is 55 125ths, also known as 11 25ths, also known as 0.44. And if you notice, based on the last slide, that's exactly what the approximation was supposed to come out to be. It was supposed to be 0.44 when we use five right endpoint rectangles. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned before, right endpoint rectangles are not the only way that we can approximate the area under a curve. We also have what are referred to as left endpoint rectangles. Let's take a look at that. This is a picture of the same function, y equals x squared, with a starting value of 0 and an ending value of 1 for my x's. And this is what is referred to as 5 left endpoint rectangles. And you did hear me right, I did say 5, even though how many rectangles are you currently looking at on the picture? It appears as though we're missing one of the rectangles, the width of each one of these rectangles, because again, the length of our interval is 1, and we are going to divide it into 5 equal pieces which we refer to as subintervals. Uh, each width will be one fifth. But this time, when we go to calculate the height, it's not the right side of the rectangle that determines its height, but the left side of the rectangle. So notice, this is the technically the second rectangle. Its height is here on the left, here for the third, fourth, and fifth. So notice what's the height of that first rectangle going to be if its height is de determined by its left side. Well, the height's going to be zero. So that's why it looks as if we only have four rectangles, when in reality we have five here. So notice in this case, before we go through the actual calculations, when we get an estimation of the area using five left endpoint rectangles, Will our approximation be too high or too low in this case? It's going to be too low. This is what we refer to as an underestimate. So let's take a look at the actual calculations. Now we refer to these instead of R sub 5 as L sub 5. But the basic idea works the same way. We are still going to add the area of five rectangles together by taking a width times a height. So notice all of my widths are one-fifth. But let's take a look at those heights. Let me go back to the picture. The height for the first rectangle is given by plugging its x value on the left side into the function. Well, the x value on the left side is zero. So the x value is zero, and when you plug zero into the function, because the function is still f of x equals x squared, you're going to get zero squared. If you look at the height on this rectangle, its x value is one width over, and since there are five rectangles, that's one fifth over, and then its height is given by plugging one fifth into the function, so one fifth squared. For this one, what x value are you going to plug into the function to get the x value for the third rectangle? You're going to plug in two fifths. So the ordered pair here is two-fifths, and the y value will be given by two-fifths squared. This one, that is one, two, three-fifths over. So this is three-fifths, three-fifths squared. This one is four-fifths, four-fifths squared. Notice we aren't going to be using the five-fifths, because that is not a height 
of one of our rectangles. This last rectangle, the fifth one, its height is given by its left side, which is found by taking four-fifths and plugging it into the function. So all of those are in our calculations. So there all our widths, one-fifth, all of our heights, zero-fifths squared, one-fifth squared, two-fifths squared, etc. And I'm going to simplify it in a very similar manner as I did with the r sub 5. First, I'm going to factor out the 1 fifth and square the numerators and denominators separately. This allows me to recognize that each denominator contains a 5 squared. So when I factor it out, I get a 1 over 5 cubed on the outside. And inside, I have 0 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared, etc. So that when I'm done with that calculation, I end up with 6 20 fifths. Now, the reason I put it in decimal form was to see, show that it matches the approximate area shown on the graph in the previous slide. So that's an example of some of the calculations we could go through to get these estimations, but I also want to kind of keep an eye on the big picture here. Uh, what we've done basically is said that the actual area uh, should be somewhere between 0.24 and 0.44. Remember 0.24 was our underestimate and 0.44 was our overestimate. So the true area should be somewhere in between those two numbers. We also saw that we got a better approximation by using, say, five rectangles than one. So the general idea is if we used more rectangles, we could get an even better approximation. So how many does that mean we should use? Should we use 10? Should we use 100? Should we use a million? Well, eventually, what we'd really like to do is use infinitely many rectangles. In other words, this is how we write that in math notation, we'd like to take the limit as n approaches infinity on r sub n. Remember, r sub n, that's our right endpoint rectangles. We're using n of them. But we'd like to let n approach infinity. Or using left endpoint rectangles, using n of them, and letting n go to infinity. This is where we'd like to aim eventually. The idea being, if we used infinitely many rectangles, we should be able to get an exact area rather than an approximation. Now the question is, does it matter which one? I mean, if we're going to get an exact area by letting n go to infinity, does it matter if we start with the right endpoint rectangles and let those go to infinity, or start with the left endpoint rectangles and let those go to infinity? So before we answer that, let's do this a little bit more generally. Everything we have done has been specific to the function f of x equals x squared from an x value of 0 to an x value of 1. Let's try and generalize this just a little bit more. So let's start by taking a look at the graph of a general function. So let's say we were looking for the area under the curve. And remember, by under the curve, we mean between the curve and the x-axis, uh, starting at an x value of a and ending at an x value of b. So what we'll do is we'll divide up our interval. Our interval goes from a to b into equal pieces, into equal subintervals is what we call those. Um, now, remember, we're going to keep this general, so we don't really know how many subintervals. It's, like, it's not like we know in advance, oh, we're going to use 5 rectangles or 10 rectangles. We're going to use a general n rectangles. So what we do is we let a be what we refer to as x sub 0. And in both math and physics, uh, traditionally when you see a subscript of 0, that means a starting value. So that's my first x value, x sub 0. The endpoint of the first subinterval, that'll be x sub 1. The next one will be x sub 2, x sub 3, etc. And we keep going. And then we refer to b as x sub n, n being the number of rectangles. So let's say for argument's sake I had divided this into four rectangles. Um, obviously the division isn't even, but this would be my first rectangle from here to here, second rectangle from here to here third rectangle from here to here, and the fourth one would be here. Those would need to be evenly spaced, but that would be x sub 4. So in general, if you're using n rectangles, b will be x sub n. And then somewhere in here, we're going to start referring to x sub i and x sub i minus 1. Okay. Now there's a big difference between x sub i and x sub n, even though they look like they're kind of the, the same thing. They're not. 
x sub n is always the x value on the right end of your interval, always. x sub i is supposed to represent a general x value in here. It's kind of the way we say, okay, well, this is in general the right end point of some random rectangle, and then x sub i minus 1 would be the left side of the subinterval for some random rectangle. And let's do this for right endpoint rectangles to start. We can, of course, look at this for left endpoint rectangles again, and as a matter of fact, we will. So let's say this is my right endpoint rectangle that I'm going to take a look at. Okay, if I draw in a couple more right endpoint rectangles, here's one, see, up on the right side, cut over. Notice my first right endpoint rectangle, it's over. My second one is under. That can change based on whether your function is increasing or decreasing. Here's my next right endpoint rectangle, etc. So the way we would calculate the width of each of these rectangles, remember what we did. We took the length of the entire interval and we divided it into the number of rectangles we'd be using. Well, the length of my interval now goes from a to b, but now b is the bigger of the two numbers, so to keep it positive, if you want the length of the interval, you need to take b minus a. And then we'll be dividing that up into n subintervals. So the width, which we refer to as delta x, that means change in x, that's the width, is found by taking b minus a, that's the length of your interval, and dividing it into n rectangles or n subintervals. The other thing we're going to be interested in are the heights. Remember, we need to know the height of each of these rectangles. So if you want the height of, let's say, the first rectangle, remember this is my first rectangle, the way I would find that, since this is a right endpoint rectangle, is I would plug x sub 1 into my function. In other words, that ordered pair right there, the x value is x sub 1, the y value is f of x sub 1. That's how we would find its y value. A similar idea for the second rectangle. If you want the height of the second rectangle, you plug x sub 2 into the function. So in general, if you want the ith rectangle, you would need to know the y value for the right side of that subinterval. So its coordinates are x sub i, that's what you would plug into your function. So the y value, the height, is given by f of x sub i. And that's how we find height for right endpoint rectangles, it's f of x sub i. So that means if we want the area of the ith rectangle, this is the area of one rectangle, the way we would do that is by taking the height times the width. Here's my height, here's my width. So this is one rectangle. And if you want to estimate the area under the curve, the way you would do that is by taking the area to be approximately the sum, remember this is sigma notation, sigma, that's the Greek letter sigma right there, always means to add up the sum from i equals 1 to n on the area of each individual rectangle. In other words, if I were to expand this just a little bit, it would be the area of the first rectangle, there's your height and your width, plus the area of your second rectangle, there's your height and your width, and you would keep going until you got to the area of the final rectangle, the nth rectangle. Now that's for right endpoint rectangles. If I instead wanted to talk about left endpoint rectangles, let's start with the same general function. So if you notice, the graph I've provided of this function has started off exactly the same way as the right endpoint rectangles. Uh, we have a function. It goes from a left x value of a to a right x value of b. Um, I have designated a as x sub 0, b as x sub n. We have x sub 1, x sub 2, etc. And then we have the endpoints of this general subinterval from x sub i and x sub i minus 1. Now if we draw in some left endpoint rectangles, we want to go through some of the same thought processes. We want to talk about their width and we want to talk about their height. Now the width, notice that hasn't really changed. Your length of your interval still goes from a to b. So in order to find the length of it, you would take b minus a, that will give you a positive distance, and then you would divide it up into n subintervals, n being the number of rectangles that you're using. So the width is the same regardless of whether you're looking at right endpoint rectangles or left endpoint rectangles. Now what's going to change is our height. So let's talk about the first rectangle again. 
Now this time when we go to take a look at the height, we need to look at the left side of the rectangle. Now this ordered pair, what we're going to have is x sub 0 as the x coordinate, which means the y coordinate, which is going to give you the height, is given by f of x sub 0. Now notice this time when you want the height of the first rectangle, it's not x sub 1 that you plug in, but x sub 0. 0 that you're plugging into your function. If we look at the second rectangle, which x value would we plug in to find the height of the second rectangle? Well that would be x sub 1 because here is x sub 1 and what you would plug into the function is f of x sub 1. So instead of for the first rectangle you plug in x sub 1, the second rectangle you plug in x sub 2, it's always the one before. For the first rec rectangle you plug in x, x sub 0. For the second rectangle you plug in x sub 1 into your function. So when we want to talk about the height for left endpoint rectangles, it's not f of x sub i, it's f of x sub i minus 1, the one before the number. Once you've got those two things established, the thought process goes about the same. The area of one rectangle would be the height times the width. Now the height is different in comparison to the right endpoint rectangles, but it is still height times width. And then the way that you would approximate the area under that curve is by adding up all of those areas. If I expand this one a bit for you, when we plug one in from our sigma notation, the x value becomes x sub 0. So it's f of x sub 0 delta x for my first, for the area of my first rectangle. The next one would be f of, when you plug in 2, you'd get f of x sub 1 because you'd take 2 minus 1 times delta x, etc. To the point where the last thing you would plug in is n, and your last area would be given by a height of f of x sub n minus 1 times the width delta x. So that's for left endpoint rectangles. These are by no means the only options for estimating area under a curve, but they are the two that we generally start with. But what if we wanted to find the actual area? I mean, that is the area problem, is to find the actual area under a curve, uh, starting at x equals a and ending at x equals b. Well, as I kind of alluded to before, the area A, so this is the actual area of the region that lies under the graph of the continuous function f is the limit of the sum of the areas of approximating rectangles. So in other words, instead of using a finite number of rectangles, like 10 or even a million, I mean a million rectangles, that's a lot of rectangles to use, but it's still a finite number of rectangles. It would still technically be an approximation. If you want the exact area under that curve, then what you need to do is take infinitely many rectangles, which involves limits. So the area A is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the right endpoint rectangles, R sub n. So this n is a finite number to begin with, but eventually we let n go to infinity. So in other words, that's the limit as n approaches infinity of, now here are all your areas being added together. Since this is right endpoint rectangles, the area of your first rectangle is f of x sub 1 delta x, the second one is f of x sub 2 delta x, and that continues on to f of x sub n delta x. And here it is in sigma notation, or summation notation. So that's how we'll find the exact area under the curve, which is in a different lesson. Notice that in this description of the area, all I said was it's the limit of the sum of the areas of approximating rectangles. I never designated which kind of approximating rectangles. That's because if you take infinitely many of them and you get the actual area under a curve, it won't matter what kind of approximating rectangles you use to get there. I mean, the value of the area is the value of the area, regardless of how you get it. So our other option is to instead take the limit as n approaches infinity on L sub n, which again, here's the expanded form on that, and here it is in sigma notation. So don't get me wrong, when you're talking about a finite number of rectangles, meaning you're approximating the area, there is a big difference between right endpoint rectangles and left endpoint rectangles. 
if you take infinitely many of them and get an exact area, it shouldn't matter which ones you were using. But as I mentioned, left and rights aren't our only option. You can use any other approximating rectangles. I mean, if you really felt like it, you could take x values that were always, I don't know, a third of the way in between uh, the two x values in every subinterval. That would be much more complicated to work the computation for, but it could be done. The third option that we tend to use at this moment are midpoint rectangles. Now, I'm going back to the original example that we discussed. This is back to f of x equals x squared from a left x value of 0 to a right x value of 1. And let's say I wanted to now take a look at what we're going to refer to as m sub 5. And if you remember what our notation is supposed to look like, you can probably guess that that means I'm about to use five midpoint rectangles to estimate the area under this curve. And again, it is an estimate. This is not exact. So let me draw in five midpoint rectangles. So if you notice, I've divided up the interval into five equal subintervals. Each one is, again, it's one-fifth long because the length of the interval is one. That's one minus zero. So the length of the interval is one. And then I've divided this into five equal subintervals. Uh, so the width of each of these is, again, one-fifth. And I've drawn in three of the midpoint rectangles so far, but I didn't want to draw them all in. I wanted to give you a chance to kind of see how this is being done. So let's say I was going to draw in the fourth midpoint rectangle. You go to the x value midway betu between the endpoints of the subinterval. So here we've got it between 3 fifths and 4 fifths. You go exactly halfway in between that. You draw up from, that's the x value that you're going to plug into your function. It's bad drawing, but I'm trying to get it right. There we go. Pretend that's a straight rectangle. And let me do the fifth one. Again, I'm going to go halfway in between x sub 4 and x sub 5. I'm going to go halfway in between, and that's the x value that I'm going to plug in, and that's how I'm going to get my fifth rectangle. Pardon my poor drawing skills. But that's the basics of how we'll draw those in, um, just to get an idea of where we're going to come up with our numbers. So for m sub 5, we're going to use the same basic idea. I need a width times a height. The widths are all going to be one-fifth. So honestly, I'm just going to leave that out here at the moment um, because each one of these heights will be multiplied times a width of one-fifth. So what I really need to do is figure out, well, what's the x value halfway in between x sub 0 and x sub 1? Now, because these are decimals, you're going to be able to pick that up pretty quickly. But let's pretend for a second it's not... Um, slightly obvious. What you're going to need to do is basically take the average of the x values. So what's halfway in between 0 and 1 fifth? I would take 1 fifth plus 0 and divide it by 2, which is 1 fifth divided by 2, also known as 1 tenth. If I wanted to know what's the midpoint between x sub 1 and x sub 2, remember x sub 1 is sitting at 1 fifth, x sub 2 is sitting at 2 fifths. I would take 1 fifth plus two-fifths and divide by two. I would literally take their average. Uh, so that's three-fifths divided by two, also known as three-tenths. So that's how I'm going to get the x values that I'm plugging into my function. So when I plug one-tenth into the function, remember this is still f of x equals x squared. That's why I'm going to square it. I'm going to take, my height is going to be given by one-tenth squared for the first rectangle. The second rectangle, my height is given by 3 tenths squared. The next one will be 5 tenths squared. Yes, that's going to be 1 half. Uh, 7 tenths squared. And finally, 9 tenths squared. And that's how I'm going to get the approximation of the area. So m sub 5, if we kind of follow the same pattern we did uh, with the calculations for lefts and rights, if you square the numerators and denominators separately. So for example, this first one will be 1 squared over 10 squared, which is 100. Uh, 3 squared over 100. 5 squared over 100. I'm going to pull out the 100. So it becomes 1 over 500 times 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 7 squared plus 9 squared. Okay. And when you get done with that calculation, 
we come up with 33 one hundredths. So again, that is yet another way to approximate the area. So the area under that curve is approximately 33 one hundredths. So there's another type of approximating rectangle. We are not limited to lefts, rights, heck, we're not even limited to left, right, and mid. We can also take a look at what's referred to as an upper sum. And again, this is still an estimate. This is not an exact area. This is an estimation. An upper sum is actually a combination of left endpoint rectangles and right endpoint rectangles where you always choose the rectangle that is the overestimate in any given subinterval. So this is a picture of an upper sum. And let me just give you an example. Let's say I was looking at this subinterval right here. Notice this is a right endpoint rectangle, and that's the one that they're choosing to use for this particular estimation. If you look at, for the same endpoints of your subinterval, if you look at the left endpoint rectangle that would have been drawn for this, you draw up from the left side and cut over. Notice in this case, the left endpoint rectangle was under and the right endpoint rectangle was over. That's why they chose to use the right endpoint rectangle for that subinterval. Take a look at this one. Same thing. If I draw in the left endpoint rectangle, it's only going to go up to here. Notice it's under. So that's why they chose to use right endpoint rectangles for all of these subintervals. But notice as soon as you switch off to this subinterval, this is currently the left endpoint rectangle. That's the one that's been chosen to use in the upper sum. Because look at what happens if you draw the right endpoint rectangle for this. It only goes to here. Notice in this particular subinterval, it's the right endpoint rectangle that's the underestimate. So they use the left endpoint instead. So an upper sum always chooses in any given subinterval the rectangle that is the overestimate, as opposed to a lower sum. A lower sum in any subinterval will always choose the rectangle that is the underestimate but it doesn't have to be just lefts or just rights. Notice all of these are left endpoint rectangles. These two are right endpoint rectangles. So you'll have to make a judgment call inside each subinterval. So that's the basic introduction to the area problem. Now to go hand in hand with that, we also want to talk about what's called the distance problem. Now the distance problem says the following. Find the distance traveled by an object during a certain time period if the velocity of the object is known at all times. So in this case, we know the velocity. What we're looking for is the distance traveled by an object. So we're going to go back to our old reliable, which is distance equals rate times time. But again, remember, this only holds in the case where your rate, or your, in this case our velocity, is constant. So again, to take a look at this, let's look at a specific example. Uh, suppose the odometer on a car is broken and you want to estimate the distance driven over a 30 second time interval. You take speedometer readings every five seconds and here's a table that results. Uh, at zero seconds, it's going 25 feet per second, five seconds, 31 feet per second, etc. We know the velocity over given time intervals and what we're gonna look for is the distance. Okay. So let's say for argument's sake, uh, we want to define just the distance for the first five seconds. Now if we want to use distance equals rate times time, uh, we're going to have to use a constant velocity. And of course the velocity for the first five seconds isn't constant. I mean, the initial velocity is 25 feet per second, and at the end of five seconds it's sped up to 31. So what we're about to find is an approximation. There's no way this is going to be accurate because we don't know what's going on in between zero and five seconds. So let's say for argument's sake, um, we assume for those five seconds that the velocity is a constant 31 feet per second. Well, in that case, the distance would be the rate, which is 31, times the time, which is five. It would be 155, and then make sure we watch the label on this. This is measured in feet, so 155 feet. So that's an approximation of how far this has traveled for the first five seconds. So that's the general idea. That's for five seconds. If we want to do the whole 30 seconds, what we would want to do is go ahead and repeat this for every single interval. So for the first five seconds, we've got it. We're going to assume 31 feet per second times five seconds. 
So then for the next time interval, I mean, if we're going to go big or go home, let's go ahead and assume between 5 seconds and 10 seconds that our object is traveling 35 feet per second. So that's a rate of 35 times a time of 5. For the next one, let's assume 43 times 5 seconds. For the next one, 47 times 5 seconds. For the next one, 46 times 5 seconds. And finally, 41 times 5 seconds. And notice that is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 seconds. And when we do that calculation, we're going to get about, we're going to get uh, 1,215 feet. Now this is an approximation. And we can pretty much tell in every five second interval, we assumed the faster velocity. So there is a large likelihood this is an overestimate. So if that's an overestimate, maybe we could also go ahead and say, okay, well, if I want to approximate it again, I can say over that first five seconds uh, that the velocity was instead a constant 25 feet per second times five seconds. For the interval between five seconds and 10, assume 31 feet per second. Between 10 and 15, assume 35 rate times time. For the next one, 43 times 5 seconds, 47 times 5 seconds, and 46 times 5 seconds. And notice that gives me all 30 seconds, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And when you do this calculation, you're going to get 1,135 feet. And again, in each one of those intervals, I pretty much assumed a rate that was a little too slow. So chances are this is actually an underestimate. So what we're starting to see is a distinct relationship between the area problem and the distance problem. Notice I have to assume constant velocity in order to make this work and that my intervals, my time intervals, are constant. Well, let me throw this on a graph real quick. So believe it or not, this is actually the graph of the function. I mean, I know it, the points aren't connected, but they don't have to be for this to be the graph of a function. And what we did when we estimated this distance, notice we took 25 times 5. We assumed between 0 seconds and 5 seconds a constant velocity. And remember, on a graph, what constant looks like. Constant looks like this. It's a horizontal line. And then we multiply that times 25. Well, notice if I draw in a rectangle, what's the height of it? It's 25. Essentially what we did was we took the area of that rectangle. Between 5 and 10, we assumed a constant velocity of 31 feet per second. And then we multiplied that times 5. So again, if you draw in this rectangle, you're going to see 5 times 31. And notice these happen to be left endpoint rectangles. If I were to connect these, which technically they're not connected, but just for kind of visual sake, if I were to connect these, those are left endpoint rectangles, as opposed to uh, in that first interval when we assumed the constant of 31 and then multiplied it times 5, this was the rectangle we were looking at. Notice in that first subinterval, that's a right endpoint rectangle. So the first estimate we did, we did right endpoint rectangles, and in this one, we did left endpoint rectangles. So it turns out the area problem and the distance problem are really closely related. As a matter of fact, remember this. This is the area problem that we just got done discussing. This is the estimate of the area under the curve by taking the area of each individual rectangle and adding them all together. But it's an estimation because it's a finite number of rectangles, as opposed to the exact area, which can be found by either taking the limit as n approaches infinity on that sum, or we c I could have just as easily put in left endpoint rectangles in here as well. I just happened to put in the right endpoint rectangles. So this is the difference between um, an estimate of the area under a curve and the exact area under a curve. That was the area problem. The distance problem is really the exact same thing. The only difference being, instead of inputting x values, meaning 
x coordinates of a function, this function actually means something. The inputs are now time and the function is a velocity function. It's how fast it's going at a given time. But if you take the time interval times some kind of constant velocity over that time interval and you add all of those together, you're going to get an approximation of the distance traveled. And sure enough, if you want the actual distance, the way you're going to do that is by taking the limit as n goes to infinity of that estimation. So these are actually the same problem. The only difference is x and f of x versus t and a velocity function. And that's our distance problem.